Wayne was supposed to welcome you, but he ran away. Oh, here he comes. <laughs> it's okay. Aww. So, you okay. know, got to be all things to all people, right? Exactly. Hey, good morning. How are we doing? Let's try that again. Hey, good morning. How are we doing today? Great, 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 great. I am so excited for you guys because the worship this morning is going to be so good. Um, and I am glad that you are worshiping with us today. If you're a guest, we'd like for you to fill out a, work, a welcome card. It should be in the seat back in front of you. Drop it in the giving station, and that'll let us know that you are here today. Um, and as we get started, we want you to watch this little short video, and then we will worship together. So I'll stand and worship with us.
righteous There is power in the blood of Jesus How priceless, how precious There is power in the blood of Jesus How priceless, how precious There is power in the blood of Jesus How priceless, how precious Continue to worship with us. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good. the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my veins oh he is my song let the king of my heart Sales. 
gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let does it to me every week. <laughs> every week. So uh, if Jesus is the king of our heart, um, and we know that he is, if you are a true follower of Christ, you can believe what he said. We're going to talk today, this morning in Romans chapter 10, about that very thing. But if he is, then we can trust him. But he has to be truly the king of your heart. It can't be something that you just think you've done or hope you've done. Uh, it has to be something that you are sure of. And if you are sure of that, then we have a hope, and that hope is a future with him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52, this is what it says. It will happen in a moment. In the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. One day, one day, this life, this life that we live, some way, somehow, sometime, is going to be over. The question is, will you be found in Him? And if you are found in Him, you will be raised with Him, whether that's from the grave or whether that is transformed as you are living today. We're going to sing about that, and I want you to celebrate the fact, especially for those of us who know our future is not in the grave. Let's worship together. Oh, shame is a prison. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. 
There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't
singing that song this morning and it just doesn't excite you then there's something wrong seriously there's something wrong because as a believer as a true follower of Christ knowing that one day we will spend eternity with him that we will not stay in the grave that should excite us and so this morning what it's going to be a little different um, our prayer time because um, the message today is uh, for some people will be a difficult one to hear. And it's all about um, our relationship with Christ, salvation, what it means, how, what does being saved really mean. Um, and so for some of us this morning, we were to come in, um, the verse is going to be read, it's gonna, the verse says are going to be read, it's going to be some verses that you've heard your whole life, and you're, gonna, you're just going to click it off. I know, I got this, I understand, I've been there, got it, no problem, click it off. But the problem is that for a lot of folks, um, they are trusting more in something they've done than really trusting in Christ. And so I want to ask you to do me a favor when we pray this morning. Just simply ask God to help my heart and our mind to be open to whatever that means. Now look, you're talking to the God of the universe. That can be a scary proposition. I get it, right? You're saying, God, do whatever you want to do today in my life, in my mind, in my heart. And that can be scary. Don't be scared. Trust that he has your best interest at heart. I promise you, he only wants what's best for you. And if that means you've been in church your whole life, but you've never really said yes to Jesus, then today would be the day when you would really truly say yes to him as we're going to see in a few moments there's a lot of folks in churches all over this great land of ours all over this world that come every week and they don't know Jesus and one day they're going to see him face to face and he's going to say depart from me I never knew you and that's the saddest thing of all 
So this morning, I just want you to stay seated. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to pray. And I want you to ask God, <coughs> God, speak to me. Take all the distractions away and speak to me. Let's pray together. God, whatever walls have been built up that keep us from truly saying yes to you, whether it's religion, whether it's we've done something that we were told to do and then we were told we were okay because of that, whether it's just simple fact that we don't understand what our role is, whether it's just pride in our own lives because we've been in church our whole lives but every time somebody speaks on salvation every time an invitation is given we feel a tug we feel a pull but we're just embarrassed to do anything about it God, take all that away in this moment it's not enough just to say you believe it's not enough just to come to church Help us to see you for who you are. A God high and exalted. The God lifted up above all. Worthy of our worship and our praise and our lives. This is your moment. This is your time. You are a great Lord. You are everything that we need. You are the sustainer and giver of all life. Help us to worship you. Help us to truly get out of our own way and to see you for who you are and to know what we need to do today. I thank you for loving us enough to continue to draw us to continue to pull at us, to continue to strive with us. We pray that someone in this place today will say yes. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of not knowing. I'm tired of playing a game. I want it to be real. This is your moment. This is your time. We give it to you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and let's worship about our great Lord. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. In grace your breath it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only God in great are you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is your bread in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your bread in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your bread in our lungs so we pour out our praise 
we pour out our praises, your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you, only God. In great are you, Lord. In great are you. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your grace. God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for um, just the fact that we have a place that we can come and worship you in freedom. God, I pray that this moment, in this moment, you will bless. God, in this moment, you will help us to see you for who you are. God, in this moment, you will speak as never before. We trust you, God. We ask that you do these things. Open up our minds and our hearts. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Take your Bibles if you have them this morning and turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 21. Of Romans chapter 10, that's the chapter, we'll do the whole chapter today, Romans 10, 1 through 21. Um, if you're here for the first time in our study on Romans, we start in January, and so there's a couple things you need to know. Now, if you've been here a lot, or you can say every Sunday, um, not many of us can probably do that, but if you can say that, then I want to remind you of a few things, as, lo- as along with telling Uh, the folks who have not been here, um, this important information. So remember that the letter to the Romans that Paul is writing is a letter to believers in Rome. And remember that as a letter goes, um, it would be um, 
the chapters and the verses were added later. So this is a letter. It would be like you going to the mailbox and opening up the mail and getting out a letter, and it would be roughly 10 pages. Now we go, what? 10 pages? Who? But remember, they didn't have any other way of communicating. They didn't have text messages and email and Facebook. And they didn't have all that. So this was, this was a normal way of communicating, right? And so it would be like going, getting out, and you open it up, and there's this 10-page letter, and you start to read it. There would be one continuous thing. We like to try to break it up in chapters, right? We're like, well, this is separate from chapter one doesn't go with chapter two, which doesn't go with chapter eight, which doesn't go with... No, no, it's all one letter. And sometimes Paul gets off track, right? He chases rabbits a little bit. And he has to get... Just like we would do, right? You're writing the letter and you're talking about, you know, Aunt Fanny's grass and weed problem in her yard. And then you get distracted and you think about what you got from her for Christmas, and that leads you, you know, and, oh, wait, wait, I was talking about the weed problem, you get back on. Well, Paul does the same thing occasionally, but it's all important, and it all flows together. And so when we're doing this, especially 8, 9, and 10, you have to take them together. Now, we can't do that because you don't want to stay here all day long for me to preach 8, 9, and 10, so we break it up. But that's how it was written. And so in 8, we remember that, you know, Paul is really um, trying to... Uh, get us to understand about the future glory, that we are being led by the Spirit and the future glory. And then in Romans 9, he starts out by saying, hey, listen, I would give up my own place with Christ if it meant that my brethren, my kinsmen, my fellow uh, Israelites could know Christ, could understand Christ. And then we get to Romans chapter 10, and he starts off the same way. And we understand the desperation. If you have ever had a person in your life that you know doesn't care anything about God, doesn't care anything about the church, then you should understand that kind of desperation, especially if you have a child or a grandchild that you know is far from God. You know they don't know Christ. The desperation that you would feel. Paul is feeling that desperation. Paul loves his brothers, and he wants them to know the truth. He starts chapter 10 off the same way. So we're going to read all 21 verses of Romans chapter 10, and then we will try to break it down a little bit and see what God might say to us today. Some of these verses will be very familiar to you. Um, some of you have heard uh, your whole life, but maybe they don't mean exactly what we have been taught they mean. Right? So... Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, who is he talking about? His brother, Israelites, is that they may be saved. Now, we know he's talking about Israelites because that's what he's talking about chapter 9. It's one, one continuous thing, right? He wants them to be saved. Listen, in our PC world, don't saved is not a bad word. Saved is not the wrong word. Saved is the word he uses, and saved is the word it, it, that it should be. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. We'll talk about that in a second. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandment shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says... Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him who they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. 
but they have not but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. And then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. All right. It's Romans. It's chapter 10. And we're going to do the same thing we've been doing most every chapter, right? You ready? Everybody go, whoo, right? Because there's a lot in there. And we can't take, oh, we don't have enough time to take it completely uh, individually, each, each verse individually. So we've got to kind of break down what we can really apply to our lives. Look, I don't know that there's a more important sermon that I'll preach this year. I don't know if there's a more important sermon that you'll hear in your lifetime. Not, not because I'm preaching, and not, but because of the message that is in Romans chapter 10. It's vital that we understand what Paul is saying. He starts out by putting the responsibility for Israel's lostness on Israel. Right? He doesn't say anything about anybody else having responsibility. Israel has the responsibility for their lostness. And I say lostness because that's really what it is. If you don't know Christ this morning, you're lost. And here's why I say that. If you see somebody who's drowning, right? If you see them, they're drowning. They're going down for the last time. If they drown, they will be lost. Then you come along, whether it's in a boat or on the bank, and you reach down, their hand's there. You grab their hand, you pull them out. They are no longer lost. They have been saved. They will say, that person right there, Jonathan Smith came along and saved my life. If you're out in the wilderness and you don't know how to get back to civilization, you are lost. And finally, a search party, somebody in the darkness, you see a flashlight and you are so excited and you run to the flashlight. Why? Because you were lost, but you have been saved. You have now been taken from the, the uh, abyss into civilization. When Paul talks about Israel's lostness, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about this idea that you are apart. You are in the woods. You are in the wilderness. You don't know how to get back. You can't do it on your own. There is nothing you can do. You're going down for the last time. Your hand is up and God reaches down through Christ's death on the cross and resurrection from the dead and saves you. He gives you the light that you see in the distance that you can run to. He reaches down and pulls you out of the water, puts your feet back on the solid ground, and you can say, I am saved. I am not lost anymore. And listen, Paul says, all of that is on Israel. One day they can't stand before God and say, well, wait a second. We're not responsible. God, you're responsible. We were your chosen people. What happened? No, Paul says, they know. They know. They they have every example that you have. And listen, here's here's the point for us today. Your lostness. One day when you stand before God and he says, depart from me, I don't know you. And you say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I partnered down there at Crossroads Church. I helped in VBS. I came. Depart from me, I I don't know you. But God, what about, you're responsible, not me. Gave you every opportunity. Wait, wait, wait. I remember that time, God, that I walked down the aisle. I said a prayer. Hey, the preacher wrote the date in my Bible. Surely that counts for something. Depart from me. I don't know you. But, but, but God, I got, I got in the, I mean, I went all the way under. It was immersion. It wasn't just a little sprinkling. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. I, a preacher took a big old picture, poured it right over the top of my head. From the top of my head to the bottom. I got completely, it was I was in a swimming pool when I did mine, God. That's what some people will say, right? I was in a real lake. Got, got completely wet, nasty, dirty brown water for you. 
depart from me. I don't know you. But God, what about your... No, it's not on me. It's on you. I gave you every opportunity. So Paul says, here's the problem. These Jews, these Israelites, my brothers, the ones that I don't want to see them do this. I want them to know Christ. I want them to know what he did on the cross. I want them to know the power of the resurrection. I want them to know that. But what they're relying on is enthusiastic works, and that won't do it. They're relying on their zeal. They're relying on their knowledge of the law. They're relying on all these things. But those enthusiastic works that they're trying to do, that won't get the job done. Like, just like being a member of some church or a partner at some church or be, being baptized or working VBS every time or being a good person. Listen, I, there are some good folks in the world. Some good, honest hardworking, loving, caring people who are lost and they're going down for the last time. That, that's, the, look, that's the truth. Because they want to come to church and they think coming to church does something. And they're on this little, what we would call this, uh, this ladder of salvation, right? They're on this ladder. They think they can somehow climb their way to salvation, but they can't. And Paul is telling them in, in, uh, that it won't do it. Here's the deal. Paul is saying, at one point, I gave you the law, but I gave you the law as a boundary, as guardrails, as a tutor, so to speak, to show you how to live until Christ comes. That's what the law is for. I gave you this, these border. Everybody wants boundaries, right? Everybody wants to be, and, you know, parents, you, you understand this. I hope you understand this. Kids misbehave, kids do things crazy. That, but part of the, really what they really want is some real hard, fast boundaries to be set up. In the, some guardrails. It's for protection. It's to guide them. It's to get them on the right track. Paul is saying, listen, I did that. Look, let me, uh, let me read this to you. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Here's what it says. Galatians 3, 24. So then the law was a guardian until Christ came in order that we may be justified by faith. So Paul, even in Galatians, he's telling the Galatians, now he's telling the Romans the same thing. He's telling them this. Listen, you got to understand this law that was given, it was kind of a tutor. It was kind of a guardian. It was guardrails until Christ comes so that you can know the truth that Christ died and was ready. You can't, you understand there's only two ways to get to heaven, right? I know you've heard preachers say, only one way to heaven. There's two ways to get to heaven. The first way is to believe that Jesus died on the cross, went to the tomb, died three days later, rose again, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And one day he will come back. And what we sang about, ain't no grave. There is no grave. There is nothing on this earth. There is nothing man-made. There is nothing that can hold you back. That's the first way. The second way is to be perfectly sinless, to never do anything wrong. Anybody close? Done, done good, right? To be perfectly, I mean to do Perfect. Listen, not one little minor thing, not one unkind thought, not one, kind of, not one unkind word, nothing wrong. Anybody there? Right? So that's why we say there's really only one way, right? There's only one way. That way is through Jesus Christ. But what Paul is saying is, listen, they've gotten on this ladder of trying to earn their way, this works, working their way up this ladder, trying to gain something, trying to get to heaven, and they think they can do it by keeping the law. We think we can do it in our day and age by having at the end of our life just do a couple more good things than I did bad things. If I could just do a couple more good things than I did bad things, man, God surely won't keep me out of heaven. The sad reality is that's not how it works. Because instead of climbing up the ladder of salvation, what you have to do is let go and fall back into the arms of grace. That's what we have to learn to do. There is nothing you can do to work your way up. There's not. I wish there was. 
I wish I could tell you, hey, just be good. You, you didn't do great the first half of your life as a teenager. You were a smart aleck. You smarted off. You said some stuff you shouldn't have said. You looked at some stuff you shouldn't have looked at. But there's still hope, right? Now you're 30. Now you're 40. Now you're 50. If from now till the end of your life, all you got to do is just do more good than bad, and you're going to be okay. No. It doesn't work that way. Because we will never earn salvation. It is a gift that is given that we have to fall back into. See, enthusiastic, zealous is what Paul, the word Paul uses. Zealous works will not get you there. It won't get you there. No matter how hard you try, it won't get you there. What does Paul tell us will get us there? Simple faith will do it. Just simple faith. That's why I said it takes faith just to fall back into grace. Just fall back into grace. Just have a little simple faith and do it. And you will be saved. Not the wrong word, the right word. Because you are wandering around in the wilderness without Christ. Now, now I'm going to tell you. the, The truth is that we in the church have done a disservice to people. I've said this before, but it's true. Because Paul says... There are two requirements for salvation, right? In, this, in, in verses 9 and 10, Paul says there's two requirements for salvation. First is this. You have to admit that Jesus is Lord. He says, confess with your mouth what? That Jesus is Lord. Conf- that's first. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now, here's the problem. Here's what we've done, in the, especially in the Bible Belt South. Here's what we've done. We've said, all right, you want to be saved? Here's what you got to do. Confess. We stop right there, right? Just confess. Just confess. Confess what? Just confess. And so we have people coming down, walking the aisle, and a pastor somewhere looks at them and says, just repeat this prayer after me. And they repeat the prayer. They write their name and date in a Bible, and they say, you're good to go. And we've got people sitting in the pews all over this world who think they are fine and dandy because they said some prayer somewhere. One time, right? They said a prayer. And here's the problem. There's been no transformation, no life change, nothing at all changed in their life. And they are counting, they are booking their salvation, their eternal destiny, because they repeated some prayer that they didn't even know what it meant and they didn't even mean at the time. That's a problem. Right? That's a problem. Because we say, well, just confess. Just walk an aisle. Just say some prayer. Just get baptized. Problem is, that's not salvation. Because listen to what Paul says. Confess with your mouth what? That Jesus is your Lord. That Jesus is your Lord. Right? It's not some halfway thing. And you say, well, well, I'm not so sure. But look, there are religions who take babies. I'm talking about young babies, like infants, newborns, two, three months old. And they baptize them and they say to the family and they tell that child as they grow up, hey, you are, you are saved. You're good. It doesn't matter what happens now because you've been baptized. And those children grow up can go out, can live a hellish life, can do anything they want, and they think they're okay because they got baptized. But look, in the the Bible Belt South, we've done the same thing. Because we have said, put your faith, put your faith in a prayer you prayed instead of telling people, listen, when you say yes to Jesus, it starts there, and it is a continual thing. It doesn't stop when you say yes to Jesus. It starts when you say yes to Jesus. You are saved, you have been saved, and you will be saved. It is a continual thing. It goes on and on, and if you can look at your life and say, I remember that time I walked down the aisle. I remember that time I got baptized, and you remember that. But you can honestly look at your life. Listen, nobody can do this for you but you. But you can look at your life and say, there's no difference in my life that day and today. I'm the same person. And look, then you probably don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's why. 
Because if God comes to live inside of you, there is no way you can live a life that's not changed. Period. There is no, absolutely no way. Look, we, then Paul goes on to say, second thing, you confess with your mouth. You admit that Jesus is Lord of all. The second thing you do is you believe that God raised him from the dead. You believe that God raised Christ from the dead. Here's why that's important. It's more than just acknowledging that because, you know, at one point, Jesus said, you believe, you do well. The demons believe and they go one step further than you because they even are afraid of God. And here's why that's important. Patrick's sitting here. I don't want anything bad to happen to Patrick before I move, go any further. Just let me say, I love Patrick. I don't want anything to happen to him. But Patrick died. We put him in a casket. We brought him in here. We put him right here. Put him right here for three days. And then I'm going to tell you at his funeral, hey, come back in three days. Patrick's going to get up. You know what you'd say? You're a fool. You're crazy. Patrick's not getting up. Patrick's not coming back. Patrick is dead, Wayne. Oh, I love Patrick. He's coming back. But you can love him all you want to. He's not coming back, right? And then you would say, and for you to believe that is ludicrous. For you to believe that is crazy. We need to get you some mental help if you think Patrick's really coming back from the dead. Do you believe Christ raised from the dead? Do you believe Christ raised from the dead? Because if you do, the world will tell you you're a fool. Nobody comes back to life. Nobody raised from the dead. Why is that important? Because if you really believe, if you give Christ your life and you believe that God raised him from the dead, listen to me. It has to change the way you live. If you really believe that. God is the most important thing in my life. I love Christ. I want to serve him. He is Lord of all. I believe he raised from the dead. Really, when's the last time you shared that with somebody? Look, if you don't really know Christ, there is no desire in your heart. That's why I said what I said this morning about rising. We're going to bust up out of the ground. Ain't no grave going to hold us down. If that didn't mean something to you, there's a problem. We come and we sit and we're passive and we think it's okay and we're just going to get by. We're just going to coast on into heaven. We're just going to coast on in. But that's not salvation. The Southern Baptist Convention did a study. They talked to pastors all over America. And they said, based on Scripture, what Scripture says about what salvation is, how many people in your church are saved? And after they gathered all the data, it came back. 10 to 15% of the people in the churches are saved based on what the Bible says, and that's what we go on. So what does that mean? That means in a room this size, maybe 15 people are truly saved, have truly given their life to Christ. Look, the only person that knows that's you and God. I don't know. But what are you basing your faith on? What are you basing... How do you know if we go outside this door today, if we walk out on the street and you say, uh, anybody, go up to anybody. We're in Hernando, Mississippi. I mean, we could say this is home. There's a, there's a church on every corner, right? We go out there and say, are you a believer? You know what they're going to say? Yeah. How do you know? Well, I, I said a prayer one time. I, I know the date. It's written in my Bible. I, I got wet. How do you know that you're a believer? Very few people will say, because since that day, my life has never been the same. And here's how it has changed. Not just anybody can say it's not, it's changed, but here's how it's changed. Right? Look, there's a missionary evangelist named Paul Washer. He tells this story, and I love it. He said he was doing revival services, and at the end of one of the services, a, a girl, a young girl came. She's in tears. I mean, just tears came to him. He, he knew her story before she came. she came. She comes in tears. I mean, she is just beside herself. I'm not talking about just a tear. I'm talking about sobbing. And she says, I want to be saved. And he said, how many times have you walked this aisle? How many times 
Have you prayed the prayer? How many times have you been baptized? She said six. And he said, then why do we go through the farce of saying the prayer tonight? Through her tears, she said, what do I do? He said, you go home. You get down on your face and you cry out to God to save you. The next night, they come back in. She comes up to him. She looks awful. She said, I cried and prayed all night long until I fell asleep on the floor. And when I woke up this morning, I knew nothing had changed. What do I do now? He said, you go back home. You get down on your face and you cry out to God to save you. The next night, he's praying with her father. He said, I I assumed he would be angry. He was excited. God's doing something. I know God's doing something. They prayed. He sat down on the front row. In a minute, she sat down beside him. Looked awful. Been crying. She said, I went. Got back down on my face. I prayed that God would save me. I cried all night long until I fell asleep. I woke up this morning, and as soon as my eyes opened, the light of Christ burst into my life, and I knew in that moment I was saved. It's not about saying some prayer. It's not about being a part of a church. It's about truly, finally giving everything to God, saying yes to Him, and allowing the light of Christ to shine in your life and to change you from the inside out. You know what Paul was saying to these Israelites, to these Romans? He was saying, look, you're following the law, you look pretty good on the outside. But on the inside, everything's wrong. Look, this morning, I I promise you, there are those of you sitting here today, and you know what I'm talking about. On the outside, you got it all together. But right now, in your heart, you know something's wrong. Something's wrong. And you know that it may be time for you to just say yes. Just say yes. Don't pray a prayer. Don't just say yes. God, yes. And then walk away from this place and live different. Live changed by the power of the Holy Spirit that's alive in you. Finally, Paul says, hey, beautiful are the feet. You know I have beautiful feet? I started to wear flip-flops this morning to show you my beautiful feet because the Bible says I have beautiful feet. When I was a youth pastor, I had a girl, you remember the movie, cartoon movie of Tarzan that came out? Phil Collins did all the music and all that, right? Remember that? I had a youth that came to me and said, I was watching Tarzan. Your feet look just like the cartoon Tarzan's feet. They're so cute. Hey, I'll show them to you. I'm telling you, they're they're pretty feet. Not many people have good-looking feet, but I do. Nothing else on me is good-looking, but my feet are are pretty good. (laughs) But Paul says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring bring the God. Here's why. Not because their feet are literally pretty, but because I walked in here today on my feet to present to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, but because how how will they know if they don't hear? Who's going to bring them? Listen, here's a mark. Here's a mark of you knowing that you said yes to Jesus and you meant it and life has changed because you have a desire for everybody to know the truth about the gospel. If that's never a thought, if you don't care if people come to know Jesus, if that is not something you're concerned about at all, maybe there's a problem. Listen, God loves you so much. And he is giving you every opportunity. But one day you will stand before him and you cannot put this on him. You can't put it on him. For some of you, the hold back is going to be pride. I've been in church my whole life. I know. I was in church my whole life. I was a youth pastor and a minister of music at a church when I got saved. I had to stand up in front of my church and say, I've been living a lie. It was hard. You know what they did? They loved me. They were excited for me. Nobody 
Nobody is going to say you're doing something wrong. For some of you, it's, just, it's never even been a thought. You, you fought this battle your whole life. You know what you need to do. You just can't do it. You just haven't been able to say yes. You tried to make yourself look good on the outside. But on the inside, as the Bible says, it's a dead man's bone. I don't know what God is doing in your life right now. But I will say this. There are people in this room that need to say yes. Quit relying on something that you've done and fall on the grace of Jesus that will save you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much. God, I I love you. I love these people. I love these people. They're my people. People who are partners, people who aren't partners in this room, people who are believers, people who aren't believers in this room, they're my people. And I love them just like Paul loved the Israelites. And I want so desperately, so desperately for them to all be able to say, I know the light of Christ is shining in my life. It's bursting in my life and I'm changed. And I pray today... Whatever needs to happen will happen. God, I pray that if somebody in this room has a loved one, a family member, a child, a grandchild, it's far from you. God, today we would get on our face. We would lift them up to you. We would pray that your light would shine in their life. God, the great thing is we can come just as we are. We don't have to get rid of sin. We don't have to clean up our lives. We can come as we are and you will save us. You will hear us. You will change us. And I pray today that you will take this moment and make it your own. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask you to